I'm Kothandao Mamageswaran, and I run the development of Vaxadata. Moving a database to Oracle Exadata comes with the promise of transparent performance acceleration, regardless of workload. But what are these performance accelerators? How do they work? And how do you know if they're operating in your database? In this session, you'll learn about the architecture, get deep technical insights on how Exadata works. You'll also see automatic workload repository reports that you can easily verify that you're getting the best out of your database workload on Exadata. When we started building an Exadata, we kept a few guiding principles in mind. First, we chose the ideal database hardware. We scaled out the database optimized compute, networking, storage, with scale out being the key. With the scale out architecture, as you add more storage or compute, it automatically comes in with more CPU power and more networking allowing for a perfect linear scaling of the entire system. We built these using standard servers. Second comes the secret sauce, database-aware system software. This has unique algorithms to vastly improve OLTP, analytics, and consolidation. And we'll go through that in more detail today. And third, we wanted to fully automate the management. The features that we enable must be simple to use and work out of the box. These are our guiding North Star principles. The same technology is now available on-premises, clouded customer, or in the Oracle Public Cloud, providing you a choice of deployment model. When we look at the customer adoption of Exadata, go across any geography, go look at any vertical, and you'll find an Exadata customer. We run most of the mission-critical systems, financial trading, manufacturing, and a lot of e-commerce systems. We power petabyte warehouses that run incredibly fast due to our technology. We reduce costs for our customers through database consolidation. We have captured most of the Fortune 100 with Exadata, and a growing number of customers are coming on the Exadata cloud. The cloud business is growing incredibly fast. As you can see from this slide, all of the top 10 automotives and telecommunications are running Exadata, and nine out of 10 in most other sectors. Let's see how we achieve transparent performance. Now, this is a technical talk, so we're gonna shift gears now and start looking into how we achieve this transparent performance speed up. But first, we have to understand the storage networking a little bit better. So let's jump into some background. A single flash card runs at approximately 12 gigabytes a second. You can put that inside a single storage server and connect it to a 100 gigabit network to a database server. The key thing to note is that the single flash card can saturate a 100 gigabit a second network. Most of the SANs do not run in the real world at 100 gigabit. That is now for a single flash card, but your databases don't sit and work on a single flash card. They don't fit at all on a single flash card. So what do traditional storage vendors do? They need the additional capacity to store your database. So they add a lot more flash devices into their storage. A single flash card was fast enough to saturate an entire 100 gigabit link. So what ends up happening is that in front end of the storage gets completely bottlenecked as they try to add multiple ports they just can't make it work. Now, a few years later, the cloud storage vendors came after this, so they got a little bit clever. They said, we want to scale out the storage. But they couldn't just put one flash card per server. That would be too expensive. So they put in four or eight or 16 cards per server. Let's use the case that they put four per server. Since we know that a single flash card can saturate an entire 100 gigabit link, they got a 4x reduction in throughput just getting out of the storage. But when you come to the database server, you carry the same bottleneck as before. The bottleneck just moved, but it never really got solved. You now have hundreds of flashcards sending their data to a single database server that's just not going to be able to consume all of that bandwidth. With that background, 
Let's look at how a traditional scan works in the database. Say you want to find all the customers who ordered an item over $1,000. The database brings all the blocks from the storage into the database. Notice that as it's going through this process, it's not getting the full flash bandwidth because of the bottleneck that we just discussed. Now it goes through that data and finds that it got lucky. The first row contains a match. But as it goes through the remaining rows, the remaining 80% of the rows, they're not used by the database. So we just got a lot of data through a thin pipe and dropped 80% of the data on the floor. That doesn't make any sense, does it? And this is why we thought we need a whole new architecture. When you run the same query on an Exadata, we do something unique and special. Instead of getting the data to where the query is executed, we send the query to where the data resides. This is unique. The same set of operations now happen on the storage. The storage looks at the data, and it matches the first row. This aspect of matching the row and sending back just that row is called row filtering. Not only that, since the query is only finding all the customers, it doesn't need to send the entire row. It just needs to send the customer's name back. This is called column projection. And all that data needs to be, that needs to be discarded is not sent back to the database at all. The database just gets the result that it needs. The fantastic thing about this idea is that queries exploit full flash throughput. There is no loss in throughput coming through the various layers of the network. This architectural difference is amazing. Here is a section of an AWR report. Look for the section called Instance Activity Stats. Also, look at the section that starts with cell. The two statistics that are highlighted are important to understand. One represents the total amount of database, total amount of data that the database thinks it needs to scan, and the other is the amount of data returned. You can see in this example that the amount of data returned is greater than 100x lower. The AWR report that you saw allows you to characterize the whole system. But in many cases, you want to understand how a specific SQL performs. In such a case, you can use the SQL monitor report. When you see table access storage full, you know that there is a full table scan that's happening in the storage. You have two pieces of additional information highlighted, a filter and a binocular. Clicking the filter brings up the specific predicates that were sent to the storage. In this case, it's finding a specific order key. Clicking on the binoculars brings up the statistics in SQL Monitor that shows both the number of bytes eligible for filtering and the amount of data returned. Notice that in this case, we scanned 173 gigabytes and returned only 49 megabytes. That's more than a 3,000 times reduction in the data returned. This is what results in the stellar performance on an Exadata. Now that we have mastered um, smart scans, let's look at a technology called storage index. Much like the previous slide, where we started with a table on the storage, the customer asks us to find all the salsa ordered between March 14th and March 20th. The table, while logically contiguous, can be split physically into several one megabyte regions in which the table exists. For simplicity's sake, I'm showing two rows per megabyte. In reality, it'll be far more. We scan the first one megabyte block, find the salsa sale, and remember that in a new in-memory data structure called storage index, that the order date minimum is March 19th and the maximum is March 20th. We scan the second one megabyte block. We don't find the salsa, but we remember that the order date minimum is March 23rd and the maximum is March 24th. So far, so good. Nothing extraordinary has happened. Let's say you run the query again. At this point, when we scan, we just look at the in-memory data in the storage index. And just by looking at the minimum and the maximum values in the 1MB regions, we can tell that there were no salsa ordered for those dates in the second region. 
So there are no IOs performed for this query, and the entire result is coming directly from storage index. Pretty amazing. The fastest IO is the one that's never performed. If you now change the query and ask for chips between April 14th and 20th, how many were ordered, there are absolutely no IOs performed for that query. Uh, also, you might be wondering, why do I show you a table with an order date and a ship date? Some of the folks you know, who see this presentation could argue that, hey, the same benefits such as storage index could be obtained by partitioning a table. If you partition by ship date, the queries on the order date won't benefit, and vice versa. With storage index, you just load your data and go, and you can query on any column you like. There have been plenty of advances in storage index. Um, you know, People start with storage index can only cache eight columns, right? No, that's such old news. Thankfully, there are now plenty of articles on the internet that correct this myth. Bring on your white tables. Storage index works just fine. Storage index is stored in memory, so it's lost at shutdown, right? Again, that's old news. In the recent releases, storage index can be persisted at shutdown automatically. And storage index doesn't just store the min-max values. It stores Bloom filters and other clever data structures. For example, think of state codes. If a block contained a value from Arizona and another from Utah, it doesn't mean that everything in between Arizona and Utah exists. The database automatically recognizes that the number of distinct values in that column is low and uses a Bloom filter in the storage server instead of a min-max. The storage index automatically adapts to changing workloads. New entries are created, older entries are pushed, all of it is done automatically. Oh, and lastly, it works on multiple data types. How does this look like in an AWR report? Here's how you can see the savings. Look for the section under Instance Activity Stats. In this case, 588 gigabytes are scanned, and 252 gigabytes are saved by storage index. So half the IOs are avoided by storage index. Huge savings. Let's look at another technology that's present in shared storage. The Exadata flash throughput is so fast that it quickly starts approaching the memory throughput. So we decided to take the in-memory technology that's present in the database and apply it on storage. The Exadata storage server automatically transforms the data on disk into in-memory database columnar formats in the Exadata flash cache. This transformation is automatic. Once the transformation is done, this enables the CPU to use the fast vector processing instructions on storage servers. This unique architecture is extremely beneficial. Once the storage server processes the data using these vector processing instructions, it returns the data using the same format, such that the database can continue using vector instructions on the results too. This enables Exadata to quickly optimize for the next generation flash as memory. Not only are scans offloaded, aggregations are offloaded too with this technology. Let's look at columnar cache in, in action in an AWR report. As you've learned so far, this instance activity section is very interesting. It's a terrific source of information. In this example, the storage server processed 664 gigabytes of data and saved us from returning 445 gigabytes of data. All of this happens extremely fast. I showed you how you can view the statistics per instance, but in some cases, you want to look at the data and see how things are going across your storage servers. I'm going to show you how to look at the smart I.O. statistics. But as you can see, there is a plethora of statistics and reports that are available. Look for the section on Exadata statistics. In this report, the first column is the name of all the cells, and it's being masked with stars, just for privacy. The first column, megabyte requested, is the amount of the amount of data that the database requests. And you can see that we're constantly optimizing these using storage index or flash cache 
And the net result is that more than 97% of the IOs have been reduced across all the storage servers. That's the offload efficiency column. This system is extremely optimized to give you fantastic performance on your scans. There are over 440 SQL operators that are offloaded to the storage server with Oracle Database 19C, and it's constantly growing. Now let's switch gears and look at OLTP. All of us know that memory is extremely fast, but now let's combine that with traditional storage. The database servers on a SAN connected to the storage, and you know the storage has memory that's locally connected. In order to perform an I.O., the database issues an I.O. call to the operating system. The operating system sends a message to the storage, and the storage issues a read from flash to memory. Storage then replies back to the database server operating system. This operating system wakes up the database. The speed of the memory read is overwhelmed by the high cost of network and I.O. software interrupts and context switches. In the end, there's very little benefit to the end users. On an Exadata, there's no I.O. software executed. No interrupts, no context switches. How does that happen, you ask? Since the data is steered, the hottest data is in memory on the storage server. The database uses a remote DMA to read the I.O. directly from memory on the storage server. This is why there is no I.O. software executed, no interrupts, and no context switches. What is amazing with this technology is that we can do greater than 2 million I.O.s to a storage server with less than 0, with 0 percent CPU used on the storage. Now let's look at persistent memory cache in the AWR report. When you look at an AWR report, look for the section under single block reads. You can see that most of the IOs to the server are using RDMA, and all those IOs run under 19 microseconds. Here are some of the unique features that you know what happened when Exadata uses shared memory. The aggregate performance of memory across all the storage servers can be dynamically used by any database server. The aggregate performance and capacity can be used dynamically too. So not only are you getting the aggregate performance, you're getting the aggregate capacity. You can also enable policies and place limits on the amount of memory that each database can use on a storage server. The memory on the storage server is, after all, accessible only to the storage servers. It uses database access controls to determine who has access to which memory region. There is no operating system or local database access from the database servers themselves. This ensures that the contents of the memory on the storage are secure. The contents that are present in this memory are automatically mirrored across storage servers. This makes it resilient to any failure of either the server or the memory itself. It's incredibly reliable. The architecture makes this simple to use. The memory area on the storage is created, namespaces are formed, regions are taken care of, and the customer has to do absolutely nothing to use this memory. And if a DIMM fails, you just have to remove it and put in a new one. There's nothing else to do. The software present in the storage server automatically creates any data structures back from the failed memory DIMM, and the system starts using the new memory DIMM for its data acceleration. And for OLTP, it's the only platform that provides less than 19 microseconds for single block reads a unique and tremendous achievement that's unparalleled. Exadata also serves millions of I.O. requests per second. That is just absolutely mind-boggling. And in conclusion, Exadata is the best platform for analytics, and you learned some of the unique technologies present on an Exadata that no one else can match. 
you learned about technologies such as smart scan that include row filtering and column projection that allow you to reduce IOs. You learned how the storage index completely eliminates IOs. You also learned how to use the in-memory format that allow Exadatas to extend the in-memory formats from the database SGA into the storage to provide significant benefits for both scans and aggregations. For OLTP, we saw how the persistent memory provided extreme acceleration for both data and read logs. The data present in the storage is directly read using remote DMA by the database server, allowing the storage server to provide millions of IOs at 0% CPU utilization. We learned how an AWR or SQL monitor can be used to measure the benefits. So it provides the best performance for analytics, OLTP, and Exadata is therefore the mission critical platform for Oracle databases. It is available on premises, clouded customer, or in the public cloud, or a dedicated region of, of your own. It's available everywhere. Thank you.